Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Laravel Worldwide Meetup. I got uh, two guests for you, like always. Uh, in half an hour, uh, Robin Malfay will join us to talk about uh, Headless uh, Tailwind UI. But first, I have with me uh, Tom Witowski, who is going to talk a little bit about a new project that he recently uh, Launched. Hey Tom, how are you doing? <laughs> Hello, I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you so I much for. <laughs> yeah, I I... also others are also fine and have grabbed some some beverages. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. I saw already some people in the chat that were uh, looking forward to your talk, so uh, that's already good. Um, so I saw you launch a. Uh, I think I think it's a side project together with. Um, um come on with Matt. <laughs> yeah with Matt Stafford. Sorry. I, <laughs> I, I saw his friendly face before you, but it's Matt, but what was his last name? Matt Stafford, of course. Uh you launched a, a side project with him, uh opendoor.me. And I guess we're going to see uh all about that in your talk, right? Yeah, uh not all because half an hour is uh far too less to talk about all of it. But I will run quickly run through uh, some some important parts of it. Yeah. Cool. So if you're ready, then the stage is yours. I'll uh, share your screen, and then you're yeah. good to go. So first of all, uh, for all who haven't seen Opanda, this is it, and it's a tool, website, platform, however you name it, to make it easier. Uh, showcasing your yeah your open source contributions so so there's a start page and on the profile we have indexed uh, a lot of github and connected it with your profile so you can quickly show that you are doing php javascript uh, html and whatever so on and in a way that is important for me to set recruiters and all other people in the hiring process can understand. Because we all know GitHub is cool for version control, but it's not so cool to showcase any uh, recruiting related resume CV things. So that's a quick run through what OpenME is. And now to the code. Um, first of all, what OpenME makes yeah, somehow special is that I would say around 90% of the application is made in the queue. So right now I'm processing around nearly half a million queue jobs per day. And this was only not even 300 registered users and 4,000 repositories. So you get a feeling uh, how many jobs uh, run through the, the queue and yeah, I've learned a lot of things during this to optimize my queue and uh, yeah, makes this happen so that your server can run so many jobs. And first of all, this is a base job I've implemented. I think uh, most of the top part is known by nearly everyone here because this is what Laravel generates if you run artisan make job. And yeah, these are... Uh, a collection, I would say, of uh, of the documentation. So you won't really find these properties somewhere in source code. You also don't get auto completion for it because this is all done with if property exists and so on. So yeah, you have to collect them on your own. And first of all, is this delete when missing models? So it's important if you have a job that is based on a model. So for example, if you want to index uh, you are uh, a user, you have a reference to the user model. And quickly, uh, I have, I will zoom in a little bit more. Cool. I was uh, just going to ask you that. Thanks. Uh, Some people are watching on mobile devices and on big TV, so you have to uh, accommodate for them too. Yeah, that's already, uh, so, yeah, I guess that's good. Cool. Okay, so, uh, yeah, and Laura does all this model resolving and serializing with the serializes model straight. 
And by default, LQ job fails if the model is deleted between the dispatch and running the queue job. So if you dispatch, for example, the job right after registration and the user is super fast and the queue is also slow and the user has, was able to delete his account before your job was uh, able to run, your queue job would throw, uh, I think it's a model not found exception and is also flagged as failed which probably isn't what you want. So you can set this delete when missing models to true, which just means uh, ignore and delete this queue job as, as it would never have existed if any of the models doesn't exist anymore. Next one is a timeout. For most use cases applications, this isn't really a thing, I think. Um, but what it does is uh, by default, a queue job timeouts after five minutes, if I'm not wrong. So if your job takes longer than five minutes, for example, if you import a large CSV file and it takes 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever, uh, it will time out and means that your job is never able to, uh, yeah, to complete and will always fail. So you can increase this timeout to a value that matches your requirements. And next one is the tries. So this is important if you want, if you know that your job can fail, but you want to retry it because uh, it can fail because a third party service, for example, isn't available and you want to retry it half an hour later. So you can say how often do you want to retry. Tries uh, is one, two, three, and so on. So an integer. And you say how many times you retry this job. So next one sounds a bit similar, nearly the same uh, like the tries one, but it's slightly different. You can retry a job without having it failed in the first place. So if your job really fails with an exception, uh, it will retry if you say so, and the max exceptions will increment. Uh, but you can also retry a job without having it failed with explicit call to retry it, for example. And so in this case, this is just uh, another counter you can set. So you can say, for example, I want to retry it five times, but after two exception, I want to uh, don't retry anymore because two exceptions means there's something really wrong. And yeah, this is just a quick helper method for me. And yeah, so this one is uh, another version to retry, to define how many times you want to retry your job by defining a date time until when you want to retry it. So you have dispatched your job, it starts to run. And now you say, okay, retry it for one day, for example. And in this case, it's not important if it runs one time, 10 times or a million times, whatever your queue is uh, possible. But uh, it just runs until this exact date time moment. Yeah, and now to my next more precise uh, abstract job. So this is a GitHub job. So it handles all the GitHub API things. And here you can see that I have said, okay, you can retry it three times, but after one exception, you have to fail immediately. And I've also defined a timeout of one minute. For all of you who don't know, the carbon interval is a amazing tool to define readable uh, periods of time. So you can also uh, add an hour here, for example, and so on. So this is a super readable version of creating uh, periods. And you also get or know in which units this result integer is uh, used. So in this case, we are using seconds. But there are also places in the lateral code base which uses minutes, for example, or even hours or whatever. So, so this is a cool way to make it readable. And yeah, so this is my abstract handle method. So you can see that I have defined some uh, standard things to do with uh, all my GitHub jobs. So if it's a batch and the batch is canceled, I have to return. 
uh, if the entity entity always returns this single model, my job is about the repository user organization. Uh, if this one is blocked, I will delete the job immediately. And yeah, the real logic I've put in this run method. And here I have some explicit exception handling. And this is also something important I've learned that you should handle exceptions you know that could happen uh, in an explicit way in your uh, in your jobs because this in first place means okay you know that this exception can happen and you have also defined a uh, real behavior how to handle it so sorry i have to close the window <laughs> Super sorry for this interruption. <laughs> and yeah, you have to handle this exception. And in most cases, for example, this is a client exception, which is part of the Gussel library. You don't want to really throw it to the uh, exception handler, but you want to define some other logic. For example, if you get an forbidden or not found exception, you want to do some things with your local models, for example, or if it's a rate limit exception, I have this method here. Uh, if this is a rate limit exception, the C3 requirements identify a GitHub rate limit response. I want to retry the job in the amount of seconds the uh, rate limit is resetted. So, so this is also a way to handle it. Yeah, and only if it's an exception I haven't handled, or I don't know about, I really re-throw the exception. Yeah. And I think it was with Laurel 8. Um, Laurel introduced the uh, should be unique interface. And this uses this unique ID, for example, method, which defines an identifier for the job set can only be present in the queue one time. So uh, I have this way, so for a user, in this case, it will be user uh, column 14, for example, as unique identifier. And if I would dispatch the same job with the same user 10 times in a row, it would only add and process at one time. So. So something also good to keep your queue clean and don't uh, yeah don't mess around with user interactions, for example. So if a user is kind of malicious and clicks this dispatch any job button uh, like an idiot 100 times in a row, it will only be in the queue for one time. And tags is something for Laura Horizon, which I really recommend to you uh, to use for processing queues. So yeah, it is what it says. It takes to quickly find uh, jobs by some model, for example, or any other label. Back off is a method that defines a strategy to uh, yeah to slowly increment the wait time between retries. So the first job fails, it waits one minute to retry the job. After the second job fails, it will be wait five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, and so on. And this is in first place good for you if you depend on a third party service because most times a curl exception, for example, or a short downtime only takes some seconds in most times. And so it's quickly up again. And it also prevents you from having a single job uh, blocking your whole queue because it's retried, 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 and so on. Uh, it will be uh, run, wait a minute. So you have one minute to process all other jobs or at least a part of it. After this, it will wait five minutes. So you now have five minutes to process as other jobs and so on. So you prevent one uh, buggy, malicious, whatever job from blocking your whole queue. And 
So next one is this is a specific job. Like some name says, load repository of contributors. It loads all contributors for one repository. And this can be really a lot. Uh, during development, I found one repository with over 25,000 contributors. Uh, to comparison, I think Laravel framework has only 3,000 or 5,000. Um, yeah, and per page, I get 100 contributors. So you know, now you can calculate how many requests I have to do only to get all the contributors. And this can really take some time, but for me, even more time was required to resolve the contributors because of some internal logic. A user can have multiple email addresses I have to compare. Uh, you have CSS Anon here. So GitHub only returns the fi first 500 contributors as full user objects. All other contributors are returned as like you get by Git log only the name and the email address. Uh, so no, you now have to match by email address with your own database. And because a user can have multiple email addresses, I have to compare with multiple strings and so on. And before this was done PHP side with a collection and lazy collection and going through it, find the first one matching and so on. And this is really slow uh, because if you have a loop with 25,000 iterations, if you only take like 10 milliseconds more with 25 per iteration. With 25,000 iterations, this is now 250,000 milliseconds, which is 250 seconds, which is around uh, two minutes already. So you see how very small optimizations inside the loop can uh, make your job in minutes or even hours faster. So for comparison, this job before the refactoring to a batch, which I will quickly talk in a minute. Uh, this job took around six hours and failed after it because of the timeout I met I've mentioned before. And now it's finished with all the batch sub jobs in yeah, kind of 30 minutes, so half an hour. And yeah, at first it all does all the requests to the API, get always 100 contributors and dispatches one job per contributor to the same batch. So this job uses uh, GitHub batches. For all of you who don't know, it's one way to group multiple jobs in uh, one yeah, batch, which has a unique identifier and also can calculate some process. So if you would show this in the front end somewhere, you can show a progress bar, which will slowly increment. And yeah, so it's a cool way to do this kind of uh, processing. It's also a cool way if you have a CSV import, for example, and uh, processing of the single lines takes longer than reading the whole file itself. So you can dispatch one job for each line. And you can also benefit in this case from your queue workers because most insta uh, app instances will spawn like 10 or 15, 20, however your setup server is. Uh, queue workers. So if you dispatch 100 jobs at the same time with 10 queue workers, which is in my case uh, the production amount, it will process, get processed 10 times faster. So, yeah. And this add repository contributor gets a repository it has to add the contributor to and the contributor data. And here you see this. Uh, difference of real user objects and the anonymous user objects, how GitHub names it. And yeah. For all of you who want to check out the real code, it's uh, public on GitHub, astrotomic, astrotomic Opendomy. And yeah, you can check it out. So some other stuff, I've already seen it in the questions, is uh, some, some macros I've added, so especially the GitHub one. I know there are a lot of packages to uh, which provide PHP GitHub API, so there is one by uh, Graham Campbell and 
also a base plain PHP one. But for me, the important part is during this authorization uh, kind of stuff and setting up the general client. And I don't need a specific method per endpoint. So I don't have to do GitHub uh, method user method show or whatever it is. Uh, I'm totally fine with uh, providing the real path after this API github.com. So this macro pro generates a pending request for me, which is prepared with all the basic stuff. So it sets the space URL, it's at uh, the accepted content type, which is here VND GitHub version three JSON. And it also generates a user agent for me. It says that I want to throw real exceptions if there's an error. I apply it to middleware here. So the cache middleware will handle this e tag and uh, cache stuff. So it acts similar like a browser. If you do the same request some multiple times, it will load the, the response from, uh, from Redis in this case and don't do the read request. So I will save some, uh, some API calls for the rate limit. And the second one here is some special handling for my local database. So if so there's some guzzle stuff and if the response is unauthorized, I will get the bureau token from the authorization header and search for a user which has this uh, beer token as GitHub access token defined and will anonymize this user in this case. So reset it to the default GitHub, no reply email address and unset all the profile details because this means uh, that the user has deleted the OpenDME application from his GitHub uh, profile and we aren't allowed to access his GitHub data anymore. So I will also reset and anonymize his profile. Yeah, and it will also set a, a random GitHub access token from the database. And this is only important for one case and all other cases, this is uh, overwritten on the later point. So on the user model, for example, I have this GitHub method here. Yeah. And if the user has a GitHub token, it will call HTTP GitHub and overwrite the token in this case. And if it doesn't have one, this is the only case, it returns the, the default GitHub with a random access token. And to quickly find one point, we are using this. Uh, So this is how it looks like if I want to call the GitHub API, I have this GitHub, uh, this user model call the GitHub method to get this pending request and do a get request in this case to users, the username and orgs to retrieve all the public organizations the user is member of. And now uh, some stuff around the yeah, let's say hosting infrastructure, however you want to name it. So uh, OpenDME runs on a total of four servers, uh, one, uh, two web servers and one database and Reddit server and one queue worker server. So uh, if or better, uh, I can spread all the load. And if the queue, for example, goes crazy, which happens like three times a day, uh, the resources for the web server aren't blocked and it's still working. And yeah, so this is my scheduler. And in general, hosting an application on multiple servers isn't this uh, complicated. So I thought it's more work to do uh, after reading some stories on Twitter, for example, and it's kind of not this much you have to adjust. So uh, one thing I had to do is for most schedules task, uh, calling this on one server. So 
So this will create a mutex for this command and store it in the Redis. So also important that you have one Redis instance for all applications and not one per instance. And this just prevents if you have three servers running the scheduler uh, doing the same job three times, which will be useless. And yeah, like you can see, I have this on one server all the time here. There's one command uh, I also limit to the environment. So I have the app env variable defined per server. So I don't use this production. Like you can see here, I use the host names generated by Level Forge. And this George's Mihun in this case is a, a queue worker. So I run this command and this one also only on the queue server. And yeah, here down the spatial library backup, backup commands I run on all servers. So I get a backup of all three application servers because I don't only back up the uh, database and I also add some files uh, from the application. So some storage files, uh, env file and so on. And this was the most important change I had to do to make it work. And yeah, some more things you have to adjust is for sure the database, for example, or primary, not really in the config, but in your ENV, not using uh, 127.0.0.1 or localhost, whatever, but the network IP address of your database server. And I can really recommend to use uh, private networks for this. So you can use an IP address like uh, 10.0.0.5, for example, and don't have to use the full public IP. And this means that you can also close and hide the database server from the public. And yeah, that's nearly everything I had to adjust uh, or really keep in mind uh, I had to do. And yeah, so this is also the most also special stuff I have to say about Opendomy. And are there any questions? Otherwise, I'm kind of ready. And I know that I have talked pretty fast because I had to do all the stuff in less than half an hour. <laughs> Pretty cool, Tom. Um, people can contribute to uh, Open Door, right? They are can, there, yeah. Are there any contributions you're still looking for? Are there is there any low hanging fruit that uh, newcomers to open source maybe can can handle for you? Uh, so I definitely have a, a, yeah, not a lot, but some uh, issues. So uh, I think this one is uh, done already. But yeah, if here, for example, at a registered at timestamp, so not only the created and updated one, but also a registered at timestamp to the database and the user model uh, using the link header from the GitHub API responses for pagination. So right now uh, I'm doing this. Uh, where is it? Yes, this paginated uses this old uh, <laughs> old hacky wake of <laughs> if the count is more or equal to the amount I expected. <laughs> Let's request another time. And yeah, so there are definitely some issues here. I also always welcome uh, some own uh, ideas. We also have uh, discussions. So you can add your own ideas, discuss them with us. Like you can see, there are a lot of ideas. And you can also take on one of these ideas. Uh, and best case, don't start right away, but uh, add a comment like, I would I would want to work on this. Uh, are there any special things I have to keep in mind or whatever? Uh, this prevents all of us from rejecting any pull requests. Yeah. What, uh, what, what is the thing that you're working on yourself now for, for Open Door? 
I have to be honest, I haven't done much during the last two weeks. I have uh, done one release uh, today or yesterday. Here yeah, today, um, adding some missing languages uh, and license, uh, doing some filament optimizations. So in the back office for filament, for example, we also, uh, yeah, could need some help <laughs> to make it more usable uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, also a quick fix. So here, for example, uh, after contribution were added to a user, we haven't touched the user model, which means that it wasn't re-indexed in the Algolia search. Yeah. And yeah, this was a quick fix. So there's definitely uh, a lot possible to do. And yeah, I'm always happy to retrieve any contributions. Cool, Tom. I, it's nice Otherwise, to see that, that, that you're yeah, using the power of Laravel's queuing system at its full extent there. So that's uh, yeah. pretty cool to see. And I also like the, the HTTP macros. Uh, I knew the, those were there, but it was already on the back of my mind. It was good to get a refresher yeah. that that existed. Pretty cool that you leveraged that too. So for me, uh, the HTTP is now a full replacement for all these uh, uh, API wrapping packages, yeah. for example, GitHub API for primary because it makes it a lot easier to test uh, yeah. because you can, I have to find it uh, somewhere here. Yeah, so it's this HTTP fake. And in this case, for example, I have fixture JSON files on the same path as the API here. And I think you could also do this in a, more dynamic function, but at all, uh, it makes it a lot easier to fake the responses for testing stuff. So with real Gussel, you would have to mock and all those things. Yeah, it's a pain. This is much better for sure. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Tom. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, we're One question by yeah. Alex. Yes. Uh, I, I have to say is that I have increased uh, uh, the database server today. So I'm using Hetzner Cloud. And now the database server runs on a CPX31, so 8 gigabytes of RAM and four cores with the AMD, which has some, I like 100 megahertz more of processing power per core or something like this. And yeah, I had to do this because uh, before four gigabyte RAM machine run out of memory. <laughs> so Redis with uh, half a million jobs per day is pretty resource hungry. And I had problems that my whole swap was 98% filled and my RAM was also around 95% used, which resulted in a lot of Redis exceptions, like Redis wasn't able to write to disk, uh, so persisting stuff and Redis was just not reachable uh, for some seconds. So if I check my my ping ping uptime here, you see this the last three days. <laughs> I had a lot of these was down for two minutes, two minutes. <laughs> yeah. So this was the reason to upgrade as uh, web servers are running. I, I think the CPX 11, so or even as a CX 11. So so that part of Laravel is, is super boring stuff. So you don't need anything. PHP is single core, so also no need for a lot of cores. And the queue server runs off the CPX21, so three cores and four gigabytes of RAM, which is enough in my case to process around 10,000 jobs per minute with uh, 10 workers. Yeah. Cool stuff, man. I, uh, it's it's pretty nice to see that the load is handled pretty pretty good. Uh, and yeah, sure, you need enough memory if you have uh, that uh, that number of jobs uh, that is going through the system. Uh. Yeah, for me, it's the first time I am uh, working on a project on on this scale. So 
before I never had to care about Q optimization, for example, because Q did some SMS or email stuff or uh, calculated like two integers, which took like 10 seconds in, in worst case. So there was nearly nothing on the queue. And yeah, now I get some real load on the application and I have to do some stuff I never had to do before. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty good that knowledge will come in handy for like the next project that you need to do where a lot of traffic is uh, is being yeah. handled. Okay, Tom, that's uh, I think all that uh, that we have time for. So yeah, thanks again for, for coming on uh, the stream. Um, yeah, I really like the project. I've said that uh, already. And yeah, I hope you get some, uh, some nice contributions uh, uh, soon. And for all, just create your profile uh, primary maintainers because we can only index repositories by registered users. So yeah, if you maintain some repositories, uh, it takes like five seconds. Wizard of Pandemy clicks the sign in button here and you are done. You can already leave. We will do all the other stuff for you. <laughs> so everybody go and do that now and yeah. Make use of of Q's, of of, uh, of Tom's uh, hardware setup. Make Redis sweat again. <laughs> yeah, and for all, yeah, you see. Oh yeah, that's that's a big number. Yeah, and so failed jobs is primary because of this uh, Redis instance going crazy. So normally this is down to zero. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, Tom, we're going to head for the break now. Uh, thanks again for uh, for doing this talk. And yeah, I'll speak to you soon. Bye, man. <laughs> See you. Oh, Okay, we are going to do a five-minute break. And uh, after the break, uh, Robin is going to join us to show us some headless Tailwind UI stuff. Stick around and see you in five minutes.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed that little break. Um, I think we are ready for our next talk. I have here with me, let me bring him on, my fellow Ghent citizen, Robin. Hello. Hey, <laughs> hello, hello, hello. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, yeah, thanks for joining the, the stream, man. Um, I, sure. I, I think at uh, the last meetup, I think five minutes after it, I saw you streaming and I thought, hey, I have to ask Robin because, yeah, yep, he'll that's, be the perfect that's, guest. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me, by the way. My pleasure. My pleasure, man. So you're going to talk about uh, Headless uh, UI today, right? Which, yep, you headless. Are the, which you are also the author of. Uh, of these yep, components. I'm mostly, mostly working on Headless UI, um, but I'm doing a lot of pairing sessions behind the scenes with Adam and David, who is also in the chat, yeah. and Brett and a lot of other people. But yeah, I'm mostly working on that at Stillwind Labs. That's correct. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, you're primarily working on it, but it's teamwork because you get like feedback from uh, from everybody yep. on the, yep. on the exactly. team. Exactly, exactly. Okay, man, uh, let me put on your screen and then... Sounds good. You are ready to go, man. Enjoy. All right. Hello, everybody. So today we are going to look at Headless UI and some accessibility. Um, and I'll do some live coding and we'll see how we can build a nice little UI and making things more accessible. So for starters, we have Headless UI up here. And basically, Headless UI is um, a set of components that make your life a bit easier and make them accessible. Now, accessibility, if people think about accessibility, a lot of people think about screen reader support, which is very important. But more importantly, screen readers, uh, and more importantly, the, the accessibility makes sure that your uh, applications are accessible, are uh, usable by a lot of people. So what do we mean by that? It's not only just um, area management, area attributes. So there is like a full, sorry for the white screen. Um, there is a full um, working spec with like uh, things you should implement and area stuff you should manage. That's all important, but it's also important that you make uh, things usable and also make things keyboard navigatable and all of that stuff. So let's imagine that uh, we have a little, a fun little application here that I built. Um, and this application is a list of invoices, for example. Now, one thing that your boss will tell you is we need a little um, actions menu up here. So imagine we go in here and we say we have some actions that we put here because these are invoices and we need to make sure that we can send an invoice, download an invoice, all of that good stuff. So let's see how we can do this with uh, headless UI. So let's start by Im importing the menu component from headless UI React. And this is currently um, a React application. Uh, headless UI also has components for view, um, and we are mo mostly focused on those two. Um, in the future, we probably will look at other tools like Alpine and stuff, um, but there's a lot going on already. But for now, React and Vue. So let's imagine we have a menu component. If I can type, that would be great. And the menu component has a button. And in this button, we will have three dots. And we will have menu items. Now, these menu items will be sort of actions that we want to do. Mainly, a menu item can be a button. And let's say as button. And this button should be download PDF. Now we see our three dots here. And when I click them, you will notice that something happens, but it's completely unstyled. This is basically where the name Headless UI comes from. It's a set of unstyled, fully accessible components. Now, I'm also using uh, Tailwind CSS behind the scenes. Uh, this is makes our lives a bit easier for styling. You should check it out it's a good project so let's start by styling these buttons a bit um so this one 
I want to use for the button, I want to use like a vertical icon. So dots vertical icon, and we can import this from hero icons. Maybe you've heard of that one. It's also a project by the Tailwind Labs team. So dots vertical icon, hero icons react, and we should import it from the outline. Okay, we can't we can't see anything because we are missing some class names. So let's add h5, h5, and let's make this a gray one. Now we have a beautiful drop down, but things are still jumping around. Um, one thing you should notice is that we have some default styles. Uh, focus styles, but we can replace those with some Tailwind UI or Tailwind uh, utilities. So what we can do here is basically when we focus, we use outline none. This is mostly not a good idea, but you can use it if and only if you make sure that you also apply alternative styles so that you can see something. So focus ring, and let's say focus um, ring pink, what shall we do, 500 maybe? Okay, that gives me a pink, a pink thing. That's that's already nice. And also make this fully rounded. So now when we focus this, it's nicely colored. Let's add some padding with P1. And here we go. So that's good so far. Now, one thing that we want to do is also style these things up here, these uh, items. Um, so we can do that by passing through class names. Again, everything is installed by default. So you are fully in charge of doing this thing. So let's make this a flex container. Let's center this a bit. Um, let me also make sure that we use flex columns in here. Let's make sure that we are using a nice, a nice little width um, of like 48, I think. Let's use a nice background, some shadow, some rounded, Corners, maybe LG. What do we have now already? We have something already. Okay, okay, that's 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 good already. Um, let's add a bit of margin between the button and this thing. Okay, cool. And notice that this is currently outlined, so we don't want that here. So what we will do is focus outline now. So currently, nothing is really happening, but we have something working. All right, next step, let's add a few more items. So let's say we have some actions and they can have a name. So this will be download PDF. This one will be maybe duplicate this thing, sure. Maybe send the invoice and maybe pay the invoice. And last but not least, we can say delete the invoice. Okay, so let's loop over this. Actions, map, map this action to a component. And this is our little component. Always add your keys, that's very important. Uh, in this case, we don't have anything really unique. So we will use the name, that is good enough. Mostly you want to do some, some IDs in here. Um, and now let's echo out this action name. Okay, and now we can focus a little bit more on, on the styling up here. Um, where shall we start? Let's say we want to make sure that this is left aligned. Okay. Now we do want to make sure that we um, have enough, enough breathing room. That's always important in, in design, breathing room, all the things. There we go. Let's also add some um, rounded corners. And I will get to this in a second while we'll do this. Um, and now that we have this, I think we are good to go. OK. So the next thing I want to talk about is basically how you make sure that you can have like nice little hover effects. Now, normally, how you would implement this is with hover colon bg200 and you will notice that when you do that you get something here it's not that great but it's working the issue with this is if you now use your arrow keys and i have a little 
key cluster down here that showcases my um, my keys that I'm, I'm I'm typing. You don't see anything here. Um, so this is something that um, Headless UI provides for you. So what we will do instead is um, this class name can also be a function, and we will return the class name that you want. This function has a back. And in this bag, you can destructure an active prop. So what you can do with this is basically when this is active, then we want to do something with a ternary operator. Otherwise, you want to do something else. So what do we want to do? We want to say the background should be pink 600. The text should be white. And in other scenarios, the text should be gray. All right. Now we have our nice hovers again, but now we also have this enabled for your arrow keys. Something that is bugging me a little bit is the spacing in between. So let's give ourselves a little more breathing room here. This is better. This is better. All right. So this is one thing that's important about headless UI is that you don't have to think a lot about the accessibility parts themselves, but you mostly get them for free. All right, one thing that is bugging me as well is the little content that is shifting around here. So let's make to let's make sure to position this uh, nicely as well. So let's make this relative, and let's make sure that our items are absolute. They are to the right, and. I think that's about it. That should be that should be good already. Okay, so one issue that you're seeing is that our other icons are peeking through. That's something we don't want. So let's use some z-index there. And now we have our um, menu item working nicely in this list. All right. Let's look a bit about at the accessibility features that this uh, component gives you. Um, a lot of people, if they want to implement such a um, tool like this, like, like a component like this, they basically stop here uh, because you can open it, you can close it, you can hover it, and you can potentially click on things. So let's let's add a quick little on click in here. And let's use a good old alert invoking item. Uh, if I can spell click right. There we go. You will notice that something gets executed. Um, Headless UI also provides you like with a bunch of keyboard accessibility features. Uh, for example, notice that we are using our mouse here. Um, instead of doing this, what we can do is use our arrow key, um, our enter key that opens it. And when you enter again, it invokes the item. When it's closed, the focus is returned to this little icon down here. When we use the spacebar key, it's doing the same thing. It's opening, and it's highlighting the first item already. Another feature we get out of the box is when you press Escape. When you press Escape, it closes it automatically. Another feature is when you click outside of the uh, menu component, it closes as well. So that's a lot of stuff you just get for free. Um, a few other things are when you press page up, page down. So then you jump to the first one and the last one. When you press the home key or the arrow key, uh, the end key. So on on Max, this is a function, and then your arrow arrow keys to move around. That's also how you can navigate uh, pages and stuff. Um, so there's nothing here that you have to think about. One thing that we can look at real quick is what happens under the hood is um, when we look at this menu, and let's see if this is visible, we basically put an ID on here of headless UI. We also manage area uh, stuff for you. So this is important for screen reader users. Um, this information will all be used in your screen reader software to notify you when things change. Um, we also have a area controls. This is basically saying this little button is controlling this popover. Um, then we have a little our wrapper here for our items. So they 
they have an area labeled by this button. So it's um, labeled by this thing. So to improve this for screen reader usage, let's add a little uh, span here with actions. And let's give it a class name of SR only. This means screen, screen reader only. And basically what this will do is, since this is controlled by this button and these buttons are just dots, you basically want to tell something to the screen reader user. So this is our actions. We also have a role of menu and a tap index for focus management. And each individual menu item has also a role of menu item, a tap index of minus one because they are not focusable. There are multiple ways that you can handle it, but by default, they are not focusable. Um, and this is basically the relation between those. Whenever I hover over a certain thing, you will also notice that in this diff where we have the, the role of menu, we get an area active descendant. And that's basically telling screen reader users again, um, which item is currently the active, the active one. So that's all the stuff you get for free, basically. So let's, let's continue a bit. So headless doesn't do anything rendering wise for you. So what if you want to group these sections? What if you want to group these two together, these two together, and then the last one? Let's, let's try and implement that. So one thing that we can do is one of Adam's favorite tricks is basically using tuples or multiple arrays. Um, and what this allows us to do is uh, group them together in, in these little arrays. Currently, this is failing because our action is now going to be a group. And it will get an, um, an index here as well because we will need it for the key. So what we will do here is we will loop over the group and we get our action back. And then we can move this thing in here. Um, one thing that is important here is let's add more breathing room. Always add more breathing room. So that's going to be here. And now I have to make sure that I wrap these in lists like this. Okay. Next, we need a um, key in here. Okay, group action. Group.map is, is not a function apparently. Uh, is that not the case? Oh, I guess I have to make sure that I write valid code. There we go. All right. So now we have some elements in between. They are not looking great, but let's let's make it a bit nicer. So what we can do here is let's add some reading room. Very important. Now on our menu items and self, what we can do is um, we have our flex, but we can make it, um, let's see, we can add a divide and a divide will just put a line in between them. So divide y is going to be gray and then 100. This is going to do some things already. Uh, now you can get little lines here. Good. Now our button, let's make it a full width. All right, here we go. Um, one thing that I just noticed is that we can get rid of this uh, padding because now we have a little bit of white space up there and we don't want it. So now we have some things going on here. Um, this P, Y can be just a P. Okay. Now we have this nice thing. Now, if you are working with accessibility a bit, then you will know that adding diffs like this in between are technically not allowed because the hierarchy is that you have a menu and then menu items. Nothing in between can be there. So Headless UI fixes this for you. Um, what it does is it will, let me make sure to look at this way. Okay, so what it does is it will go over the DOM and everything in between a role of menu and role of menu item will get the role none. So this is again, to make the accessibility, accessibility tree totally valid. So you don't really have to worry about doing things wrong. Um, a lot of stuff is, is happening for you and that's basically what's happening here. Um, again, since we are basically in control of rendering, the, uh, the actual usability 
stuff is still implemented. So you can still use your arrow keys up and down, up and down. That's all working fine. So let's imagine that you can't duplicate this PDF. OK, you can disable the button. So let's add a disabled prop up here, make it true. And one thing that uh, the menu item can receive is a disabled prop. Think of it as your normal buttons or input items. It's going to be disabled when this is true. If you don't have a disabled prop in JavaScript, it's going to be undefined. And undefined is falsy. So uh, this is just going to work. Now, one thing you will notice is when I start hovering, we can't really hover over the duplicate one. Um, the styles are not great yet, but we can improve that later. Another thing you can see is when we start using our arrow keys, we will basically jump over it because it's it's disabled. It should not be invocable. Let's improve the styling a little bit. What we can do here is say, when this action is disabled, we can get this information from this prop, from this uh, little object. Uh, when it's disabled, then we want to say, um, let's say opacity 25 maybe. And let's reset our cursor. Otherwise, don't do anything. And now we get a little grayed out disabled prop over here. Um, one reason why we are basically forwarding this disabled prop is that in some of our components, because we have other components like list boxes and stuff, um, some of them can be disabled on individual item level, but also on a group level. Um, so it's it's quite nice to forward this so that's just a Boolean. Um, in other scenarios, it could also be that your disabled logic up here can be uh, a computed property, like some function that you are invoking, and then you don't have to duplicate it. So basically, we are forwarding that for you just because of this. All right. Um, a few other things I want to talk about is, for example, how we can compose things together. So currently, we have a menu component, but we have a few other components as well. So one of those is a transition component. Because currently, the, the um, menu component is just popping in and out. And that's about it. So we can, we can improve things a little bit here. So let's import our transition component. And in Headless UI, it's pretty easy to do this uh, logic. You basically wrap your transition items. Transition, all right. And a transition will, by default, render a diff. But we don't want a diff. We basically want to put all the props onto the menu items. So what we can do is we provide an S prop fragment. The S prop will basically allow you to overwrite um, the underlying element that is being used. So let's import this fragment from React. Um, for the TypeScript fans out there, one thing that's pretty cool about the S prop is if you have like, we have an S button here, notice that the href here is um, being marked as incorrect. This is because an href can be on a button. But in case that you are using an anchor tag, then it's totally fine. So for the TypeScript people, you get a little bit of um, help here as well. So let's make this a button again. Back to our transition. So what we want to do is we want to enter in. And when we are entering, what we want to do is we want to transition with an uh, ease out and a duration of 100. And let's say we also want to transform. This is important for the next step. We want to start at enter from. And we want to enter from opacity 0. We want a little bit of fade-in going on. And we also want a little bit of scale going on, so scale 95. And we want to enter 2. Where do we want to enter 2? We want to enter to opacity 100 and scale 100. So this should give us something already. This nice little effect, this is only going on on the enter state of, of things, not on the leaving state, because we didn't implement that just yet. But we have this going on already. So for the leaving stuff, we can do basically the same. We can transition. We want to ease in this time. We want it a little bit, little bit faster. And 
let's say transform again where we we want to live from opacity 100 scale 100 we want to leave to opacity 0 and scale 95 all right now we should have the logic built in to fade in fade out and scale a little bit apart from that all the stuff is still working so you can still open up use your arrow keys press escape there are a few cool things that you don't have to think about that are important here important here like when you press enter to open it and you quickly press escape you, you want to cancel this transition so this is basically happening for you behind the scenes uh, so again something else not to worry about all right what is, what else can we can we talk about here so a few things that i didn't talk about yet is when we open up this thing another thing is uh focus trapping so when we start tabbing around you're sort of locked into this menu and this is because again accessibility reasons you are you have a menu you have to do an action you either do the actual action or you don't and you press escape or click outside so that's again stuff that's managed for you all right a few other things that are maybe a bit more technical but um atlas ui also provides you to control the the rendering of things so now we have uh this menu items it's currently being being mounted and unmounted in in react that means um it's mounting into the dom and then it's removing it from the dom again when it's when it's done you can control that behavior by by using uh unmount false and what it will do in that case is basically um make sure that it's status display hidden uh, and that's something common to common you will see in in view applications um I see a few questions in the chat. There is indeed outside click functionality. So when we have this menu open, we can click outside and it will close for you. So if we zoom out a little bit, most of this code is basically all styling related. There is not a lot of stuff going on to, to the actual um, accessibility side of things. We have a list of actions. You can imagine that they are hard coded somewhere or that these are actually implemented currently they just use a stupid alert but you can imagine this doing real things but apart from that there is nothing you really have to have to think about and i think this is one thing that's very important for the web um it's it's not so much about making sure that screen readers or work properly that's very important but it's it's more important that everybody can use your application um, so by providing all these keyboard shortcuts, it's it's just something you don't have to think about and it will make your life a bit easier. And we've seen it at Tailwind Labs as well. Um, so this is the most important stuff I wanted to talk about uh, for this part. Um, a few small other things is we use a lot of this resource, the, the W3C working draft where a lot of these components are uh, described and that we use for like reference. Um, Headless UI itself is also fully open source. Uh, you can dive in and look at the packages that we have. Currently, we are focused on React and Vue. Um, but again, hopefully, maybe soon we will look at like more, more uh, native JavaScript implement implementation or maybe something like Alpine. Uh, now, especially that Alpine day is coming up. Um, so there is that. Other stuff is if you are a customer of Tailwind UI, then let's imagine, let's go to a nice example here, like the select menus. So we have nice designs here. This is a premium package of ours. It's fully accessible with it's built with Tailwind and, and nice designs. But if you can see, we are we have like React tabs and Vue tabs in here. And those are basically all implemented using our open source and free headless UI library. Uh, so if you're a customer, you can benefit from, from this for free. Um, if people are interested, this 
small application that we just built here uh, will be available on GitHub. And I will probably have it something somewhere in the show notes or in the description or wherever we can put it. Um, and I think this is this is about it that I wanted to talk about. And yeah, check out the the Headless UI documentation. We have a lot more lots more components going on here. Um, we will add a few more in the future now that we are working on e-commerce packages, and we will uh, update this accordingly. And enjoy using Headless UI. And if you have any questions, feel free to open up issues or jump into the Discord of Tailwind CSS. We have a Headless UI channel there as well. And that's it. That's it for me. Cool, man. Very, very cool stuff. Um, it's, it's amazing to see how easy that um, these components make it to make like a, a, a quality experience. I still remember the pain of implementing all of these things myself, and I don't ever want to do that again. Uh, and here we've yep. just done it in half an hour time. Amazing. <laughs> yep, that's indeed the goal, to build the components once and never think about it ever again and just focus on the stuff you are you want to implement, like your business logic, your your styles, your design system, whatever, but you don't need to care about all of this interaction ever again. That's that's sort of the goal. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, let's maybe finish by maybe mentioning one more thing here. You're doing streams okay. yourself, right? Where yep, can people uh, see those streams? Huh? Yes, I am streaming on Twitch. Um, so if you go to my website, I have a few links down here. Maybe, I don't know if you can see them very well. Let me zoom in real quick. Um, so I'm at Malfe Robin on Twitter. I have my users page. That's very important because I've seen a few people ask for what editor I'm using and, and what tools I'm using for, for my window management. Um, so if you go to my website, there is a lot of links going on for my GitHub, for my Twitter, for my Twitch. And I stream at twitch.tv slash Robin Malfe. And I don't really have a schedule, uh, but I stream often enough and I work with Headless UI on the stream. I work with an invoicing system that I'm currently building and that's where this little example was uh, inspired by. So you can check me out there as well. Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks again for, for this talk, uh, Robin. And yeah, have You're fun welcome. creating more components uh, like these. Uh, we need them, so keep on creating them. We, we, will, create, <laughs> we will keep creating components. Cool. Okay, man. See you around and thanks again. <laughs> Ciao. Okay, we are at the end of uh, this meetup. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I didn't plan uh, a next one yet. Uh, still have to hunt uh, down some uh, some good speakers. The aim of this meetup is to give uh, new speakers a chance. So if you want to propose a talk, head over to meetup.larvel.com and propose a talk there. And maybe you can speak at the next meetup. Thanks again for attending and see you the next time. Bye-bye.